I was a boy, I believed that the sea was boundless and indestructible to human pressures. Now I know better. Fish live in there because they destroyed their habitat. As a nation, if we're undermining the traditional maritime use, we need for climate change, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and degradation. And these are taking away somebody's rights and liberties. There's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. Everybody says, put it out there. Who cares what happens out there? Let's just get it out of my sight. What's on Mars, but we can't figure out what's in our oceans. Oops. Most of the world's coral reefs are bleached or dying. There are dead zones the size of small states off our coast. Most of the biggest fish have been harvested, and there are places where jellyfish have become the catch of the day. And all at a time when we have to deal with aquaculture, wind and wave energy, even oil and gas exploration that are staking claims in our waters. But I have also learned there's a smarter, more lasting course than the one we're on. At a time when our demands of the ocean are expanding at an unprecedented rate, and the failures of our outdated, piecemeal way of managing this life-giving resource are becoming abundantly clear, the time has come for a fresh approach based on stewardship through cooperation. In the small fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, Aaron Longton and his colleagues are making a living off the sea in what they hope is a lasting way, a way that serves not only the community of Port Orford, but the sea life that sustains them in return. Port Orford's long-term outlook for the waters that feed them is part of a blossoming movement to take better care of the ocean for the good of all. It is a movement of scientists, businesses, fishermen, farmers, governments, and citizens who care for the sea. When you rub it one way, you'll notice that it's smooth. And if you rub it the other way, it gets a little bit rough. It feels like sandpaper, right? In 2010, the United States adopted its first ever national ocean policy, a policy that now calls for bringing together people from across the societal spectrum to carry out a new, far-sighted strategy for sustaining the country's ocean, coasts, and Great Lakes. It is founded on a branch of conservation, more formally known as ecosystem-based management, more simply, as a common-sense approach to preserving life. It is backed by science and based on the needs of the human community in balance with that of its ecological provider, the sea. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipping is extremely important to this economy. We generate about a million jobs in California. One in eight jobs in Southern California is associated with the port activity, and then nationwide it's between three and four million jobs. So I see marine spatial planning as a tool that will help ports uh, delineate the area where traditional maritime uses are gonna be protected scientific research. Do we need we're it? We're finally getting it. Thanks to our reserve. If it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Our I said if. Yes, it's not. To meet some of the movement's pioneers, we will journey from coast to coast, as well as the land between. From the fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, to farmers along the Mississippi River, to the Gulf of Mexico. From divers in the Florida Keys 
to whale researchers and industrial shippers in Massachusetts Bay. All are now practicing a new philosophy of marine stewardship, of prosperity through preservation. Well, Accelerate Energy I looked at the market in the northeast U.S. as far as there was a great energy need here. And we have a solution to bring an incremental supply of natural gas to uh, the Northeast. And that's where we developed the Northeast Gateway Deepwater Port. We knew coming in that the whales would be an issue. So I got this phone call from these guys at Accelerate going, hey, you know what? Time is money. Every day, we're not in the water. That's, that's costing me a million dollars and people sitting around waiting to start building this terminal. Fix it. And guess what? It can't work 80% of the time. It's got to be bulletproof. With Accelerate's financial clout, Cornell's bioacoustic know-how, Woods Hole engineers, and Stellwagen's marine biologists all on board, the unlikely collaboration took to the water, developing the nation's first ever acoustic whale detection system. Tourism is the number one industry here in the Keys. People come down here to go fishing. They come down here to go diving. They come down here to enjoy our climate, our environment, to enjoy the beaches. They come down here just to hang out in Key West. The tourists that come down here spend $1.2 billion every year. And that's before the economic multipliers kick in. So someone has to be here to keep a pulse on the, this environment while the four million visitors come down every year to enjoy this environment. We have a public process here, as well as sanctuary. The council's sanctuary. solution was to partition the key's most critical areas. I understand where you're coming from. Borrowing some time-tested techniques from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the council adopted a special set of marine zones to protect the sensitive reefs from overuse and to separate conflicting uses. And ironically, in separating the people, it brought them together. That sounds fine. We need a healthy marine environment, and we need resilient coastlines. Increasing water quality, decreasing nutrient introduction, um, increasing and, and restoring and improving habitat function, um, all of those things build toward a, a healthy marine environment. And they don't need to come at the cost of economic development. The important thing is that the ecosystem retains its resilience, its ability to survive. And that goes also for the people who live along the coasts. Uh, we, we want resilient um, communities. We want communities that can withstand floods, withstand hurricanes, withstand other threats that, that may occur, and, and still survive. And, so if our, if our human communities, if our animal communities, you know, can be resilient, uh, that, that's the most important thing. We see clearly that jobs can go with conservation, that we can continue to fish, let's extract fish from the ocean, and do it right, and have a conservation ethic around how we fish, and, and still have our jobs and, and have our income for our, for our families. I'd like to look at this as kind of a generational aspect. I mean, like my father, there was never any question that there was an abundant timber, abundant fish. That was then, and, and this is now. And my son, he's going to be faced with different challenges. There he goes. You know, nothing ever got done without one person giving a great idea and moving it forward. So I just think everybody needs to be conscientious and work hard towards a better future. And if everybody is conscientious about it, then slowly things will move in a better direction. <laughs>